my <clears throat> my God, this guy is coming back again with uh, PowerPoint presentations. So good morning, Dobre Dien. I think we are in a Russian house here. I'm very happy that I have the opportunity to address you. Um, before I go into the slides, let me say a couple of very general words. First of all, as you rightfully said, Conergy is one of the veterans of the industry. 11 years around, we founded Conergy, two of us, to, uh, 11 years ago. Um, that was the time, many of you may not remember, where people in Lucio dannenberg were walking around in self-knit sweaters, and they were putting up on roofs PV, and when we looked at them, we talked for the first time about profits in the industry, and they said, no, this is for a better world. You don't earn profits with these things. This is something you do for the next generation. And I can tell you, we think you have to earn profits. And um, the Aspen Institute, which may be known to some of you in the US, came out with a phrase a couple of years ago, which I liked tremendously, which was, we will only solve our climate problems in this world if we're going to make them business opportunities. If we can invent something that is new and make it business opportunities that generate profit, and then we will solve all of these problems. Now, um, since I've been in the industry, I've seen three cycles, maybe even four right now. Demand-driven cycles, supply-driven cycles, I'm going to get into that in a minute. And um, what I've seen, as I just explained to you, is a beginning of, you know, from a better world uh, initiative and startup, startup to an industry which is now mainly driven by the biggies of the world. There are the Bosch's of the world, the Siemens of the world, the GE's of the world, the Sharp's of the world, the whatever the names are of the world. So all that has been changed. And from a nearly non-profit driven business model to something which today is IRR driven and mega fields, megawatt fields, which you can see all over the world. So that is basically what we've seen. And the last point, and that's a little bit in reference to what you just heard, the last point is that um, it's also an industry where technologies are still changing tremendously. The technologies of most of our, in our industries, are probably where the automobile industry was 1910 or 1910. It's, the jury is still out whether it's going to be silicon-based or thin film-based. All those things are still in development, whether it's going to be organic cells, whether it's going to be anything, nano, whatever. So all those things are still developing, and this is an industry which is always ready for disruptive technologies. And so look at those things and uh, wait for them to come. A couple of words on the market, then on Conergy. This is probably outdated the minute it was printed. All I'm saying is there are today in 48 countries, maybe today even 50 countries, but when it was put up, 48 countries which have some type of feed-in system, support system, subsidy system, and 32 of them have implemented actually a feed-in system, something which is close to Germany. And when you look at the top left side, that was you know, what was originally designed. And, but today, we've seen, just with the decisions of the German government, very different things where they have one-time caps, where they one-time reductions on the feed-in tariff in addition to the ones that have originally been planned. But you see very similar programs in Greece, you see them in Italy, you see them in France. Some directed more to private roofs, some more directed to mega systems. You see an enormous new development in the US coming up, Australia, very attractive region, India, and even China in itself coming up you know, with new of these things. It's a changing target, and it's still government subsidized and government driven. And everyone who goes into this industry should know that this is based on government subsidies until now. So why do we have these government subsidies? We have them because there is a time limit over a certain period of time of the development of the industry. We want to cope with the extra cost of the development of the industries. And slowly, these costs are reflected in declining feed-in tariffs. In the end, where to? Hopefully to great parity. Grid parity probably will be, you know, it's, it's seen as something which is very clearly a defined 
value, something like, say, 27 cents in Italy with certain radiation, or it can also be something that probably will be very variable within countries, date times, and seasons. So we're going to see different descriptions of grid parity and what grid parity will be in the future. If we want to continue on that path over time, we will need better storage solutions. We will also need bridge solutions between the old fossil supply, power supplies, and the new ones. You've seen those things that Lichtblick comes recently, Lichtblick came out with Volkswagen and others as well, which are probably bridge technologies that will bridge this development of a subsidized power supply system over to a market-based system over time. The next one shows you, in, as well, at a certain point of time, a description how we see the world in supply. You see two lines on top, 23.3 gigawatt to 15.9. Uh, one is what we see as a maximum supply curve, the lower one as a kind of more reasonable Conergy supply curve, which we see in the world. And then you see the various countries and rest of the world and in this graph. And what it says and what it shows is uh, from 2008 through to 2011, probably we're going to have more supply than we have demand. But is that always true? No, it's not true because we even have quarters where we have a, a supply-driven, you know, allocation-driven market. That was last quarter in Germany where the total market was sold out. And it may even be the case in the first quarter of this year as well in Germany. So in specific markets, you might have different situations. But in general, that is the demand and supply curve as most of the people in the industry sees it. Now, if we have a look at the value chain in our industry, on the left-hand side, you see the polysilicon part, which is an oligopole, which is driven by just a couple, two handfuls of companies on a worldwide basis. Then you see the ingot waiver cells and modules part, which as well is also asset-rich, so people have to invest a lot of money in order to get into that market. And once you've invested the market, all you do, you want this machine, these machines in this factory running. So you're going to work and you're going to supply the market as long as you are cash positive. And that is actually what we see today. It's, there is an oversupply. Oversupply had enormous pressure on our price. That's what we've seen in 2009. And that's basically coming out of it. What this shows as well is the names of the companies which are now dominant in the market. You see the big ones, as I said, Kyocera, BP, Sharp. Um, you see Solar World, one of the beginning ones, like us, Conergy, you know, who started in that industry. But you see more and more of the big names as well in that industry. On the right-hand side, systems and sales, and this is growing in importance. This is probably, in today's world, the very important part of the value chain. How do you get to the market? How do you get to the customer? Who owns the customer? Does a brand matter in our industry? This is all what you see on the right-hand side. It's the access channels which you need. It is the, the route to the market. And is, you know, how do you get to the customer? And this is the point as well where quality, it's the point of access of quality. That is where the quality commitment is given. And we've seen in the last two years in our industry tremendous quality problems. Actually, we provide to the market a 20-year product, 20 to 30-year product. And we've seen in the last two years big names of big companies pulling back a one-year production of modules, for example. So quality is becoming more of an issue. It's a very important issue. And that is the point at the right-hand side where you actually meet the customer, the customer and user demand. And that's where the quality commitment has to be proven. <laughs>